good morning good afternoon and good evening ladies and gentlemen we would like to extend a very warm welcome to each one of you at the nice global conclave from the lakhs of the beautiful himalayas where the nepal institute for international cooperation and engagement is located the think tank was established in the month of february in the year 2016 It undertakes independent research in the field of international relations, foreign policy, security studies and development. NICE has four research centers: China Studies, Neighborhood Studies, Non-Traditional Security Studies and Security and Strategic Studies. The institute focuses on eight research topics: climate change and energy, global governance, sustainable development and smart cities, refugee and migration, China's Belt and Road Initiative, border and transboundary water politics, Indo-Pacific affairs, disaster management, and international economy and development. Previously, NICE has had the opportunity to host distinguished speakers from all around the globe. It was a great pleasure inviting me to speak here at NICE. It's a real pleasure to be able to speak with all of you. But thank you anyway, and I certainly admire the work that you're doing. Uh, I'm very happy to be with you all. NICE Global Conclave is the flagship event of Nepal Institute for International Cooperation and Engagement. The theme of the 3-day conference is connecting Nepal to the world by bringing leaders, diplomats, business leaders and scholars from all around the globe. The objective of this conclave is to introduce Nepal to the world and at the same time update the Nepalese policymakers and experts about the fast-changing geopolitics which will help Nepal to reshape its foreign policy to achieve its national goal. This is the session F of the conference and the session is going to be on soft power and public diplomacy. And to chair and moderate the session, uh, it's real pleasure to have Professor Dr. Agnieszka Kuzweska here with us. Dr. Kuzweska is an associate professor at Institute of Middle East and Far East uh, Faculty of International and Political Studies at Yagolian University in Krakow. She also lectures at Warsaw based Collegium Civitas University and is a member of European Association for South Asian Studies. She has authored several books, articles and research papers as well. So without any further ado, I'd like to request the chair to take over. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to welcome everyone uh, again. Uh, I hope that I'm audible. Can you hear me? Mm. Yes. Okay, wonderful. So let us start uh, with the session soft power and public diplomacy. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank for the introduction for this nice video, and uh, I'd like to thank Nice, Nice, to for bringing uh, uh, scholars, practitioners uh, together to participate in this wonderful event. Uh, so today, uh, during this session, we are going to discuss uh, public diplomacy, soft power. I would argue these are two tremendously important pillars of contemporary international security and international relations. And uh, if we include uh, the discussion on soft power into international relations, we can uh, have a more uh, thorough, uh, in-depth uh, analysis of, of contemporary regional and global dynamics. And uh, so today, Uh, we have five uh, distinguished speakers uh, who will um, discuss these issues uh, of bilateral uh, interactions uh, with reference to soft power on, uh, at the uh, level of international organizations and certain uh, case studies of soft power policies of diff different countries. Uh, from Russia to China. So without any further delay, I would like to ask our first speaker, Ambassador Dinesh Patnaik, 
Director General of Indian Council for Cultural Relations, please. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Agnieszka, and that's uh, very nice. Um, and I find that I'm among the professors, and I think Ambassador Gorge is the only one who has been a practitioner with me. Uh, so what I will do is I will speak generally on soft power and public diplomacy because there are many issues in soft power and public diplomacy which we tend not to discuss most of the time. Instead of going to specific topics, I will talk generally. Uh, though normally I don't like the word soft power. I mean, it's, uh, it's something which I feel very uncomfortable with. I use it uh, uh, since Joseph Nye coined the word in the 1990s. This has been a most overused word and everybody uses it, so I use it, but I'm not really comfortable with it because it's got power connotations. And I believe soft power is more about influence uh, because he actually, Joseph Nye said that uh, it is the ability to influence behavior of others to get what you want. But uh, for me, uh, it is more about influence than about power. So, but still everybody is using soft power, so we shall use it. And Nye talked about liberal democratic policies and free market economy. But today, the range of topics on which soft power is there has increased a lot. It's not just democracy, free press, elections, <coughs> economic strength, but also heritage and culture, religion, performing arts like dance, music, theater, movies, cinema, scientific power, IT, space, atomic energy, cuisine, handicrafts, textiles, you name it. And now in the pandemic time, people talk about health systems, pharma, vaccines. Uh, the country's leaders make a difference of how soft power is seen. Uh, so it has become a much wider construct. But these are all only soft power assets. They are not soft power. You have to translate the assets into what you call soft power. And it's not easy because power, when we talk about power, is an external source. When we talk about soft power, it is something which is more influence rather than power. And influence comes from within. It has to be internalized and believed in. The person who is influenced has to believe in what he is being influenced about. It cannot be imposed from outside. Like, for example, believe in the fact that US education is one of the best education in the world. That's a belief. It is not imposed by the Americans or anybody. There is a belief because you see the system where it is. Or the belief that yoga is a great system of health and exercise. It has benefit. It's a belief that you have. So these are things which soft power means internalizing the influence. And when it comes to between countries, international relations between country, it's about perception. How does one country perceive the other? not only the leadership, but also the people and the institutions. So if you have a positive perception, whatever the country does, you tend to see it in a positive light. Always the glass is half full. You tend to forgive anything that they say or do. And if you see a country in a negative light, you see it glass is half empty. All the action you see with suspicion as to whether the action is being taken for its own purpose or is there a uh, other purpose behind it. Of course, there are countries with relations in which there is no perception at all, and you only go by actions and interest. For example, a relation between Nepal and Bolivia. I don't think so. They have any perception of what Bolivia is, or Bolivia has any perception of what Nepal is. So they go only by actions and whatever they create among themselves. But for many of the countries, the perception comes from many factors. I mean, we told you all the factors from democracy to heritage to cuisine to everything. But the two most important factors are trust and credibility. These are most important because do I trust the country and its actions? Or are all these soft power assets of that country credible? If a country consistently says one thing and does something else, then its credibility is low. If it regularly breaks internationally accepted norms and rules, then there is very little trust in that country. How do you trust that country? Professor Nye had said in 2012, if you remember, he said in the 21st century, credibility will be the scarcest resource. How do you bring credibility? And this is where public diplomacy comes in. How do a public diplomacy system of a country portray trust and credibility of that country? People see public diplomacy as spin doctors, you know, people who embellish reality, who uh, put a spin on things. But that's not true because in today's tech-driven world, of course, in today's tech-driven world, it is easy for a country with a lot of resources to embellish reality, to put a spin on things. And you can do it. I mean, if you remember Goebbels, if he said, 
if you tell a big lie and keep repeating it enough, people will eventually come to believe in it. So if you have enough resources that you can keep on telling a lie. So there are countries with a lot of resources which can spread the word around. But today's world, tech-driven world, is more transparent and where there's an information overload. There is information everywhere. Very difficult to hide the truth. In fact, in today's world, there are many versions of the truth. You can, you can have many versions of the truth. So public diplomacy becomes one of narrative, of a credible narrative based on facts. How does the public diplomacy system create a narrative which is credible and based on fact? And we again come back to the question of credibility and trust. And if you look among the younger generations, I mean, we are all older, probably Agnieszka is one of the youngest among us. But, but when you look at the younger generation, there is very little trust and credibility in government. And this trust and in government institutions. So what does public, uh, public diplomacy does? Is it about propaganda? Because again, Nai had said, the best propaganda is not propaganda. Because soft power is a fragile thing. It takes years to build an image, but it takes only one incident, one wrong move, one falsehood, one negative thing to break that image. So you need to be consistent and normative. No hypocrisy. You have to walk the talk. What you preach is what you do. And this has happened to many countries. They say something, they pre preach values, but they don't practice it themselves. So your soft power assets actually go down because you don't preach what you talk. But, and the main problem with soft power, with people who think they have soft power, is hubris, pride. And that is the problem which has happened consistently. I mean, you look at democracy, for instance. When Joseph Nye said liberal democracy is the most important aspect, if you have it, it's the greatest soft power you have. It was a great soft power till you decided that you will now forcibly democratize other people, other countries. So you, you used the hard power to enforce soft power. So you went into Iraq where you said, okay, we will now make you democratic country. So, you know, so then soft power loses its appeal. And the same thing, the Chinese did the same thing to the West. They used the hubris of the West. The West thought that if we bring China into the fold, we integrate China into the system, China would become democratic like us and there would be free market in China and we will all live happily ever after. But China used that same thing. They used the hubris of the West. They took in their capitalism, but they never let the market become dominant. They never let government system, the state was always dominant. They actually used capitalism to strengthen one party uh, system in their country. So in a sense, Hubris has been the weakness. And then China itself had the hubris because after it became uh, strong enough, it thought it could export its own variety of uh, um, power, soft power, the Beijing consensus against the Washington consensus. So this is something you have to watch out for because this is something which will keep on happening always. So public diplomacy becomes a balance between influence and hubris. How do you balance? So it's a balance. You have to keep a proper balance between projection and propaganda. How do you project a country? And what is propaganda? Because today's world, the moment you start doing something, it's seen as propaganda, people stop believing in it. And that is very important because that in, to that end comes the fact that you have to create a narrative that is again credible, trustworthy, and based on facts. That is very important for public diplomacy. And you have to show the country as being playing an important role in the global arena. A country that is an asset to the world, respecting international norms, and helping in setting global agenda and policy. You have to look at that because there are many issues which we have to solve together. You know, there are global issues which we cannot tackle individually. Issues like climate change, terrorism and extremism, um, you know, poverty and hunger, inequality, inequality in the world. All these can be addressed if countries get together. And if you are seen as helping in doing this, then the credibility and trust of your country is great. Then your soft power is actually a power and that your public diplomacy is able to project it in a manner in which people trust you and believe that this country has the influence to be able to play a major role in the world. And that is where I will end. Uh, if you have questions, we will take it. Uh, if you want to talk about India specifically, we can talk later on. But I just wanted to set the trend for what we are going to discuss. Thank you very much, Agnieszka. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was very interesting. Uh, speech and I would also emphasize one thing that uh, also um, Indian community, experts, people who live in different countries, they also have tremendous impact on projecting positive image of India. 
you uh, maybe you don't know, but in Poland, for example, we celebrate Holly Diwali. We have many Indian restaurants all over Europe. It is there. So it also has a, a tremendous contribution to projecting the image of India, irrespective who is in power in India, whether it's Congress or BJP, and irrespective of domestic changes within India. I well. agree with you. No, that, that's true. And not just uh, the Indian people, it's also about the leaders. So you have people like uh, head of Microsoft or head of Google or head of being an Indian. It makes a lot of difference the way you see the country. I agree with you. But what or, my point was... Or vice that, president of the United States. Yeah. Within so, so it, we look, also so, in the United yeah, We look at it as soft power assets. We have to use mm -hmm. those assets. So the work of public Absolutely. diplomacy is how to use those assets. Thank Absolutely. you. Thank you very much. And now let's proceed to our next speaker, Ambassador Georgi Sovika, President of Romanian Institute for Europe Asia Studies. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I have to prepare, first of all. Ah, it's not working. Okay, we'll um, uh, we'll start uh, without uh, without power PowerPoint because I don't want to to keep you. Uh, you see, we'll see uh, the with your you screen. can share. You can share it now. We are, we ah, can, you can share it because you, we can see your screen. Uh -huh. You you can see my my screen, huh? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, you see, uh, uh, we don't see the yeah. presentation. Please open the presentation because we can see your picture uh -huh. presentation. Yeah. Is now it okay? Oh, now, now it's okay. <laughs> okay, I am very sorry. It's technique, you know. <laughs> uh, initial. Okay, okay. This is my my my, my assistant. He wants to to tell me how to do it. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, so, first of all, I would like to, to congratulate uh, uh, Ambassador um, uh, Dinesh for a very, very interesting uh, presentation. And uh, honestly speaking, I have learned a lot. Thank you very much. And uh, I also would like to agree with our dearest chair that uh, Indian people are presenting a very good image in uh, Poland but in Romania as well. So now uh, I will try, you see, my level best uh, to speak initially about the definition of a soft power. And after this, I would like to, to see if ASEAN can be considered as a soft uh, power. And of course, ASEAN as a soft Indo-Pacific power. And which are the arguments that ASEAN can play the role of driving force in regional architecture and catalyst element of balance in the, in the region. Please, slide two. In my opinion, a soft power should be based on the respect by all means and without any interpretation meant to bypass the sacred principles enshrined in the United Nations Charter, the most important being non-interference into internal affairs, observance of independence, non-violation of national sovereignty and, and, and territorial integrity. A soft power is taking actions and pursuing diplomacy in good spirit of understanding, flexibility, and respect of the other side by, by maintaining the diplomatic language, refraining from using a strong approach and the superior attitude. The soft actions and diplomacy should not be interpret, interpreted as a weak signal, that it has to be pursued clearly and firmly. Once one crosses these lines, he will find himself in the paradigm of the hard power. Where does ASEAN stand? One of the ASEAN's greatest achievements is exactly its soft regional and international actions and diplomacy, which are recognized and respected in the whole world. Starting from the day of its foundation, reaching the moment of, of signing the Treaty of 
amity and cooperation and adopting of its charter, there is no instance to situate ASEAN in the position of breaching the United Nations Charter uh, principles of its own principles. On the contrary, the UN principles became the foundation of all ASEAN important documents. We find this attitude in the relations with ASEAN members them themselves, as well as in the regional and, inter and uh, international re relations of the association. ASEAN is a model of regional de development. ASEAN so far has passed through three important steps. Exclusive economic regional organization, primary economic regional organization with added political security and social cultural dimensions, and regional organization in full process of political security, economic and social cultural integration, which led in 2015 to ASEAN com community based on three pillars, the political security community, economic community, and social cultural com community. Two principles underline what has now been popularly called the ASEAN way. One is the consensus-based de decision-making mechanism, and the other is non-interference principle. A lesser important norm, which is a consequence of these two principles, is that all of ASEAN decisions are su supposed to be non-binding. ASEAN community is developing, in my opinion, without hesitations or second thoughts, towards the target of one vision, one identity, and one community. The ASEAN co community is so far is the top level in the process of ASEAN's being a, in, in existence, conducted to an institutionalized economic power at regional level, while transforming Southeast Asia into an emerging region in the global community of nations. ASEAN has achieved the status as the most successful regional grouping among the developing countries and as the second most successful one after the European Union at the global level. This positive development signifies an important step forward for Southeast Asia to be able to promote with a greater added value its interest in the global, in the global community of uh, nations. ASEAN, a soft Indo-Pacific power. Geographically, ASEAN is situated in the middle of the Indo-Pacific area. The content of ASEAN policy and role in the Indo-Pacific is provided in the 2019 ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific. In all political and strategic statements, of representatives with high and highest rank of the stakeholder, stakeholders in the world and in the Indo-Pacific space, it is constantly highlighted the centrality of ASEAN, particularly for maintaining peace and stability in the whole region. In other words, it is recognized the position of ASEAN as the driving force in the regional architecture, including Indo-Pacific, as well as that of the pillar of stability and the catalyst of reaching regional balance in its position as an important Indo-Pacific power. Naturally, in this important position, ASEAN is not taking sides in the political game in East and Southeast Asia, as well as in Indo-Pacific region. ASEAN has quite rapidly managed to capture the attention and interest of world and regional powers. Later, it formed a unique architecture of an institutionalized dialogue with all important actors in the context of world and regional politics. All its dialogue partners accept and support ASEAN targets. Even more, all of them are involved directly or indirectly in the developments of the association and integration process in Southeast Asia. One may speak about a real competition in the development of an advanced and most advantageous relationship with ASEAN in order to assure their presence in the new Asian brand in political, economic, strategic, and social cultural fields, as it is the case of ASEAN community. ASEAN got 
a much stronger international representation in United Nations and other international organizations and develop a diplomatic status by accrediting ambassadors to ASEAN from its members, as well as from friendly countries such as Romania. The fruitful historical bilateral dialogue and cooperation between Europe and Asia, as well as the EU-ASEAN partnership, have recently developed into a continent-to-continent -continent approach. Romania has recognized from the very beginning ASEAN status of an exclusive economic regional organization and not a substitute to SEATO as some other countries considered ASEAN to be initially. In EU and the ASEM, Romania is promoting strong relationship with ASEAN. <clears throat> the guarantee that ASEAN is able to fulfill its role as driving force and element of balance in the region resides in its charter where it is clearly stipulated that the association is determined to maintain the centrality and proactive role of ASEAN as the primary driving force in its relations and cooperation with its external part partners in a regional architecture that is open, transparent, and inclusive, and shares the commitment and collective responsibility in enhancing regional peace, security, and prosperity. The most important space to exercise the role of soft power in the Indo-Pacific region is the ASEAN Regional Forum, IRF, which to date is still the only forum in Asia that addresses regional and international political and security issues. The development of IRF was in fact initiated by ASEAN and the organization revolves around ASEAN. At the same time, IRF is the single venue that is able to include all the relevant parties at Indo-Pacific level, such as India and Japan, ASEAN, China, EU, US, Russia, Canada, and others. As a, con as a conclusion, I would like to say that ASEAN needs to take into consideration that it needs a lot more efforts to cope with the additional very serious and even dangerous issues on the regional agenda, as a result of international and regional power competition. As you see, I didn't say rivalry, I said competition. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ambassador. And as uh, this panel is only one hour long, so without any further delay, I would like to ask uh, our next speaker, uh, Professor Dr. Stanley Rosen, Professor of Political Science, University of Southern California, uh, to deliver his speech on U.S.-China competition. Please, um, the floor is yours. I, okay. Um, I have to get my screen set up, though. Okay. Um, if I... If, uh, you'll have to uh, close your screen share. You'll have to close your sharing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, ah, I didn't. I, I thought I did. No, you only close your presentation. Okay, okay, okay. Is it oh. okay? Oh. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Now okay. it's okay. Okay. Um, let's see. Okay, let me be conscious of the time. Uh, so I, thanks uh, for inviting me to this very, I've really enjoyed what I've heard so far. Um, let me see how far I can go uh, with this. Um, I'm going to be talking mostly about film and, and soft power. And the competition in, in a sense between uh, Hollywood and China. And so I would start off by looking at the obstacles that China faces. Um, if you look at the worldwide box office all time, if you look at the top hits, you notice that four of the top 10 are just the Avengers movies themselves. And all of these are franchise or tentpole or sequel films. Um, very hard uh, to compete with that. And most of the 
box office comes from outside North America uh, internationally. This is uh, 13 to 24. Again, it's a lot of the Marvel films, uh, Disney animation films, and, and so on. So it's very hard structurally for China to compete with that. In fact, the only film in the top 100 all time uh, that is not from Hollywood is a Chinese film, uh, Wolf Warrior II. Um, but almost 100% of that market was in China itself, uh, not internationally. So it's very hard. Um, on the other hand, if you look at the top 10 all time international box office hits not in English, nine of the top 10 uh, are in Chinese. They're, they're uh, Chinese films. The only exception is Mel Gibson's The Passion of the Christ, uh, which is in Aramaic, Latin, and Hebrew. But otherwise, China dominates uh, non English uh, films at the international box office. But again, almost 100% of that box office is within China itself, not internationally. Um, if you look uh, through the end of 20, uh, actually it's right up to the present, 2021, the all time box office in China, uh, you see only one Hollywood film among the top 10, Avengers Endgame, and only two among the top 15, uh, The Fate of the Furious, the Fast and Furious franchise. So again, China controls its domestic market, uh, not as much as India or the United States and North America, but it's getting closer to that goal of controlling its domestic market, but not internationally. Um, this is through October last year. Um, you see that Hollywood share within China uh, has gone down uh, as of 2019, it was 30%. Um, of course, 2020, 2021 are aberrations because of uh, COVID. So we'll have to wait and see what happens. But the trend is clear that China has an increasing share of its own domestic market. So what we're seeing is a bifurcation. Hollywood films do very well, obviously in North America, dominates North America, and internationally also is very, very strong. Within China, China dominates more and more its own market. So you're seeing a bifurcation of, of uh, Chinese films and Hollywood films in terms of market share in different locations. I'm sorry, some of my slides are in Chinese because I've given these lectures in China too. Um, and I don't know how many people know Chinese, but let me just say that if you look at the overseas box office Chinese films, in terms of country by country, the, mo the most successful Chinese film, you still, you still see Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, Wu Chang in Chinese, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon still dominates many of the markets, um, all the Europe, almost all the European markets. Uh, Italy, a hero is, was stronger, but in most of, of the European markets. Um, and that was a film that came out in December uh, 2000. So it's been over 20 years, but still is the most successful uh, Chinese film internationally. Um, now, I wish I had more time to talk about this, but uh, Zhao Ting or Chloe Zhao won the Academy Award, the Golden Globe Award for her film Nomadland. And she is from China and lived in China till the age of 14. Um, but because of comments she made in, in a number of interviews, um, she has basically been banned from being discussed uh, on Chinese official or social media. Uh, she started off uh, as the pride of China. Now she's been seen as disgracing China by China's nationalistic uh, community. And this is what they, if China wants to succeed, they really have to rely on people that are internationally successful like Chloe Zhao or Zhao Ting. Um, but they haven't done that. So they censored her Oscar win. Um, they, uh, what I told the Wall Street Journal at the time was there's a basic contradiction between wanting to claim credit for someone who was born in Beijing, who has succeeded in the West in a creative field, yet also trying to control the message of how great and successful China is. You can't, in a sense, have both. Uh, the control competes with 
the desire to claim credit for someone uh, who is Chinese. Um, what China wants to do uh, is to become a strong power, strong film power like the U.S. by 2035. Uh, Wang Xiaohui, the executive deputy director of the Central Propaganda Department, director of the National Film Bureau, uh, told the leading filmmakers in China they should take the Chinese dream of the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation as their theme and have patriotic plots. If they have a clear ideological bottom line, they can't challenge the political system. In other words, there's a lot of restrictions on Chinese filmmakers, a lot of censorship. Um, and if you're going to take the Chinese dream of the rejuvenation of the Chinese nation as your major theme, you're not going to have much of an international market. Uh, ideology, again, is a contradiction with trying to be successful internationally. So whereas Wang Xiaohui notes that the international influence of Chinese film has a long way to go, um, following his guidelines will not be the way to succeed. Uh, China is very concerned about having a growing presence in the film industry uh, so that after the Academy Awards in 2019, when Green Book, uh, the short animated film Bao, and the documentaries Minding the Gap and Free Solo were nominated or won uh, Best Film Awards, uh, the Chinese official media said that the 91st Academy Awards can be viewed as the starting point for a new period of growing influence for China in the international film industry. But if you look more closely, uh, China's claiming credit for individual awards by creative artists based only on ethnicity. Alibaba gave some funding for Green Book, but had no creative input. Uh, Domi Shi, who came to Canada at the age of two, directed Bao. Uh, Liu Bing came to the U.S. at the age of five, directed the, the skateboarding documentary, Minding the Gap. And Elizabeth Chai Vasanhili and her husband, Jimmy Chin, who directed the Academy Award winning Free Solo, both were born in the U.S. His parents were born in China. Her mother was, her mother was born in Hong Kong. But China is really desperately grasping at straws to claim credit uh, for all of these creative successes. Uh, if you look at the foreign language films at the box office in North America from 1980 to June 2021, five of the top 15 are Chinese, but there's been nothing since 2006. Uh, Crouching Tiger made 128 million US dollars in North America, more than twice as much as any other uh, foreign language film ever marketed in North America, even though it's over 20 years old. But in more recent years, it's India that has done better. Uh, Bahubali 2, The Conclusion, is number 12. Uh, Monsoon Wedding, number 16. Dangal, which also did very well in China, is number 20. Padmavat, number 23. PK, number 29. So India is actually much more successful than China in North America, and I would say in Europe uh, as well. Um, China's tried various models for success. Uh, they've tried using leading American actors like Christian Bale, Adrian Brody, Tim Robbins, and so on. Um, Wang Karawai has an international reputation, um, and they've promoted his films like The Grandmaster, Yi Dai Zongshir. Um, but again, not very successful. John John Koo is a great filmmaker, uh, but he's very much an art house filmmaker. Chinese comedies, patriotic films like Wolf Warrior II, Lost in Thailand, they simply don't travel uh, internationally. Um, now, uh, Matt Damon was brought in to save uh, China in a way. The Great Wall was in a, the big attempt, uh, budgeted at, at over 150 million US dollars. Uh, the Great Wall was the co-production that was supposed to be the breakthrough movie um, for China. Did not work, and I can spend a lot of time talking about that. I've written on that before, uh, and I answer any questions about that. Um, and that was the last big co-production in 2016, unsuccessful. If you look at the worldwide box office in 2021, obviously it's mostly Chinese films, and again, 100% of the market is within China. 2020, again, because of COVID, uh, most of the top films, or many of them, uh, are Chinese. I've got a couple more, and then I'll stop. Uh, I'd like to spend a lot more time on this, but another example, if you look at the Berlin Film Fe International Film Festival, uh, and I won't have time to play the 
uh, hyperlink video clip from Juliette Biloche and the jury, but uh, Johnny Mo's film uh, email Jonger one second at the very last minute was re the Chinese government said you can't really show this film, uh, so it was pulled from the festival. So the entire jury went on stage uh, to lament the fact that we can't see this great film by Zhang Yimou because it's about the Cultural Revolution. Although the Chinese uh, never gave any official reason for the ban, so that Hollywood Reporter, all the all the film business magazine said, uh, why is China pulling this film? They never they never give a reason, which just simply makes for more press critical of China when they do that. So it's it's not really uh, very wise. Um, and I think this is my last slide. Again, it's in Chinese, but um, here's an example of the problem that when uh, director Chiang Kai from the Hubei Film Studio died of COVID, the obituary, if you can, you can find, if you look online, the obituary uh, emphasized his desire to join the Communist Party, his role in politics within the studio, nothing about his creative input, nothing about him being a film director. And that's, I think, the bottom line for China is soft power. Number one is directed at the domestic audience, and number two, it oversees Chinese, um, but not really um, internationally in terms of trying to make their films uh, more successful. It takes second, third, or fourth to politics uh, and control. So even though they spend well over 10 billion US dollars a year on soft power, uh, it is not the highest priority internationally. It's basically the highest priority domestically. So with that, I will stop. I will stop sharing my screen and turn it back to everybody else. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Rosen. That was a very informative speech and I do agree with you that Indian movies are much more popular also in Europe. Bahubali, I know perfectly well that Bahubali has also a very important Indian asset uh, called Prabhas. So everybody, I think, interested in India and South Asia knows this uh, wonderful actor. Uh, uh, okay, so now let's uh, proceed and uh, Agnishka, Dr. Leela. Agnishka, can I just ask uh, Professor Stanley, how many films does China allow from uh, Hollywood in a year? Because that is the biggest control. Yes, um, there, it's an interesting question. There's a quota system of imported films, not just Hollywood, but all imported films of 34, 14 of which have to be in 3D or IMAX. Now, in certain years, they have gone beyond 34 uh, when the box office was not as, as high as they would have liked. They wanted to make sure there's a, a, an increase every year in the uh, box office in China. So they quietly introduced more Hollywood films at the end of the year without saying the quota is unbroken. But there's also a, a films imported on a, on a flat fee basis where you pay uh, to buy the film and you can show it as often as you like. And there's a third model, which hasn't been used very often, but it's a hybrid model where um, you sign an, an agreement where um, you import a film on a flat fee, but if it makes more, let's say that 100 million US dollars, then it becomes a revenue sharing film. The quota films are all revenue sharing films, what the Chinese call fun zhang pian, revenue sharing film, so that uh, Hollywood, for example, get, gets 25% of the box office, far less than it gets in other countries. It used to be only 10 or 13, 10 to 13%, but after 2020, went up to 25%. Co-productions get 43%. So it's a complicated issue. Um, but thank you for your question. Uh, so now let's ask uh, Dr. Lila uh, Nai Chai, forgive me if I mispronounced your name, assistant professor from Tripuvan University, and she will talk about Chinese soft power through academia. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Agnieszka. Uh, you have pronounced well. Uh, thank and you. good evening to all the uh, participants and presenters. I'm honored to hear the very experienced views today. I would like to share my uh, presentations, first of all. Uh, 
um, hello, namaskar, and good evening. I'm going to present uh, China's soft power through academia in Nepal. This is uh, a par part of my PhD thesis. It was on Chinese public diplomacy in Nepal. And this is uh, one of the part of it. As it has already been discussed, uh, whether we we would call it uh, we would like to call it soft power or not, but the uh, general term that we found in academia is the soft power. Here I'll, I have uh, deal with cultural diplomacy uh, that is organized by the cultural institutions, particularly Chinese cultural institutions. That's what I am focusing on. And along with those cultural institutions, universities are taken. And all these actions uh, has created the soft power. This is the assumptions. Uh, this is the argument. And for my arguments, I have employed the, uh, these data sources. Uh, one of uh, the data sources is Confucius Institute of Kathmandu University. Uh, the websites where I have collected its news events, all those things, from 2007 to 2017. And um, another is the Thirvan University International Bulletin of the Center of International Relations, where I have focused on different activities with the Chinese uh, academia. And uh, last one is my own questionnaire with the 65 Nepali students they have responded to me, to my questionnaire on the image of China toward them, for them. So uh, while I'm analyzing, I have employed the Joseph Nye's soft power uh, and the PAN S, uh, it's uh, regarding on Confucius Institute project and Zaharna and three other, two other authors uh, on Confucius Institute and soft power. The activities, uh, I have, obs I have uh, observed through those data sources are the exchanges of the people, study of the foreign language, interact with foreign tradition, lifestyle, costumes. Uh, basically, uh, rather than social relationship, because I have found very less social relationship between Nepalese and Chinese, uh, I have focused on the above uh, four, uh, these three, particularly three uh, uh, aspects of the cultural diplomacy. Uh, here uh, in, in Nepal, Confucius Institute was established in 2007 um, in Kathmandu University. Kathmandu University is one of the renowned universities in Nepal and where it is, it is considered that the very um, elite family uh, students, uh, those who belong to uh, a kind of higher class, they choose to study in Kathmandu University. And uh, as the studies so that the uh, Confucius Institute generally uh, first choose such kind of allied institutions, uh, the same happened in Nepal. So Chinese, they teach Chinese language. Uh, actually, China generally introduced Confucius Institute as a Chinese language teaching center. It generally, the, uh, the language always comes with culture. So uh, I have introduced here Confucius Institute uh, as a merged institute with language and culture that spread Chinese language and culture at the same time. And uh, here, uh, two universities are engaged, Nepalese Kathmandu University and the Chinese Hubei University of Economic and Business is engaged. And uh, both, of the, uh, both of these universities work uh, horizontally in the organizational structures and uh, the institute uh, is uh, functioning in Nepal, Kathmandu University. And the Chinese embassy in Nepal uh, cooperates or facilitate, facilitated their task. Uh, as, this, uh, as the author Pan S, the Confucius Institute has the three cultural diplomacy, engaging with local communities, targeting uh, allied classes, and presenting China's harmonious diplomacy. The Confucius Institute, CIKU, uh, also its uh, activities 
are also uh, similar to these three approaches as proposed by, as uh, argued by Pan. Uh, this is the data that I have collected from 2007 to 16, uh, and the, um, the number is much higher in 2013 when it was established in 2007, but the 2013 significantly higher in number while engaging with local people because it, these are shown by their activities as I have collected from the website presented by uh, exp uh, published in their official websites. Uh, while they have to engage with local communities, uh, what they do is that uh, the CIKU celebrates uh, their festival, like uh, spring festival and different kind of uh, festivals, autumn festival, uh, all those things. And sometimes they also compare spring festival with the same festival that the Dasin festival is celebrated by Nepalese and also organized uh, different cultural lectures, uh, Chinese volunteer teachers, particularly are the actors for teaching Chinese dance, song and food cooking, all those things to the students, to the Nepali students, not only students, uh, while celebrating those festivals, they engage the local people um, as well. And they organize uh, tour, field trip, picnic, where the local people are engaged. So this is how they, the institutions engage the local people. As in a uh, conference, um, the former vice president Liu Yangdong said that China will place culture construction at a more prominent strategic position, pay more attention to cultural soft power construction, expand the breadth and the depth of the people to people relation and cultural engages between China and public countries. Here, I would like to note that the, uh, in China, rather than using the public diplomacy, uh, after 2013, uh, the, uh, after they announced the Belt and Road Initiative, they are more uh, interested to use the term people-to-people -people relation rather than public diplomacy. So uh, the President Xi Jinping also uh, called for, the, for increasing the people-to-people -people connection. So in their academia and others, they are most likely to use this term nowadays. And uh, how I find, uh, how I found the targets to elite classes that they often invite the political person and the university vice chancellor, lecturer, scientists. These, these are the generally organized visit or paid visits to, in the CIKU, either from uh, China Either they visit to Nepal, some of the uh, Chinese ministers, dean, mayor, mayor, university chief ambassador, they visit CIKU often and they do not, uh, they give proper importance to Confucius Institute. And also they, uh, the Confucius Institute, they regularly invite head teachers of the school where the Chinese classes are organized and they, uh, they made uh, programs to visit they have uh, made they, ha they are made to visit Hubei University of Economic and Business, Peking Language University, Tsinghua University. These universities, academias are the big source to influence or to attract Nepali uh, Nepali elites classes, classes, uh, scholars, and many others. And they also represent through their activities, they represent the China's harmonious diplomacy that not only they teach the Chinese language, but that those Chinese teachers are also learning Nepali language. They are not only imposing their, uh, it, it, they wanted to reflect that the Chinese are not only imposing their language, but they are also learning Nepali language. As we know that there is a uh, Ch Nepal, uh, Chinese radio program in Nepali language, and in many universities also started Nepali learning centers uh, in Chinese universities uh, so that uh, through language, because language is very important uh, medium to understand each other. So uh, to understand each other, uh, they are learning Nepali language as, as well. And the uh, very good arts, the dance, very attractive things are presented so that uh, they could attract uh, Nepali Nepalese society and people. 
And another uh, dimension of this study that I have employed is how the uh, countries, countries in institute communicate. So uh, please, please do proceed to the conclusion because we will not have time for our last panelists and at least a short Q and A session. Okay, so just last minute and conclusion. So these are the three uh, approaches of the communications network structure, network synergy, and network strategy. How they uh, uh, communicate with the, this is the organizational structures of the uh, CIKU and the, um, how the buildings relationships incorporate diversity. Uh, they they try to incorporate diversity not only students but also also athletes and women's are uh, invited in their uh, programs and different other things like in 2008 Beijing for the Beijing Olympic they have organized the program for them so CIKU uh, work as a source source of the soft power uh, as they teach many languages as we found that um, in previously um, big powers like United States uh, and United Kingdom also use the language as uh, language spreading as one of the uh, one of the effective source to influence uh, foreign foreigners. So uh, Chinese soft power, you know, the, the impacts of Chinese soft power is that here in Nepal now the Chinese groceries, Chinese restaurants and Chinese food cuisines is very common now, at least in Kathmandu uh, Valley. And uh, many youngsters are uh, ready to use the, um, uh, ready to learn and learning the Chinese language. And with the uh, university, Chinese universities as well, there are so many uh, engages, uh, engagement is increased after 2008, as, we, as you say in the diagram. And uh, the, um, uh, as the education of the China is internationalized, these are some names that they are engaged with Tiwan University, the Chinese name. These are the engagement between the scholars of the Chinese uh, Chinese universities and Tiwan University. And uh, my, uh, as the uh, respondent showed to me that the Nepalese students are very uh, interested to China and Chinese academia. They think that Chinese academia is very good, very nice, and they also, think that China has good impressions left over uh, them and uh, they are very impressed by the Chinese economy and Chinese academia and they think that Chinese people are very laborious not cheating to others so this is the good things that uh, it has uh, impacted open and so uh, in conclusion I would like to say that uh, Dr. Leela, please allow our last speaker to say a few words at least okay so just last sentence. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. uh, so is it is it over? Yes. Yeah, so you finished your presentation. You don't want to say any last sentence. Okay. So the, uh, so now our last speaker is uh, Victoria Ivanchenko uh, from Russian International Affairs Council, expert and visiting fellow at Nice. At Nice. So please, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I'm trying. Going to be um, short. Uh, I'm going to focus on active, I would say, dimension of uh, Russian soft power in the post-Soviet space. Uh, in my previous place of work, which is uh, Russian Foreign Trade Academy, uh, we made uh, very long and um, uh, pretty, uh, I could say, deep um, uh, investigation on this topic during almost one year, but uh, now I'm going to focus on those main conclusions that which we had. I'm going to do that presentation, so I hope you will um, understand everything I'm saying without uh, any uh, graphs and um, arguments of uh, visual, uh, I mean, in visual dimensions. Well, uh, why for Soviet space? Uh, why is the post-Soviet space still uh, very important for Russian, uh, could say, sphere of influence uh, for Russian foreign policy, and why um, it is still regarded as one of the main areas uh, for um, uh, expanding Russian soft power? Uh, first of all, it's Russian neighborhood. 
uh, and uh, it is the issues of security, political and economic cooperation. Um, and also uh, the post of its face is uh, the region of Russian speaking people. So it's the main region where uh, people still speak Russian and uh, uh, it's an additional tool for dialogue, for uh, creating um, friendly uh, relations and for friendly neighborhoods. And then officially, uh, CIS, which is Community of Independent States, is priority, the main priority of Russian foreign policy. It is um, described uh, so in the Russian foreign policy concept. Uh, then Russia has uh, common historical and cultural heritage with all those countries, even if uh, it is a question of disputes, a question of some hard discussion, but there are still uh, those uh, heritage, uh, common uh, uh, famous people, common uh, literature, which still uh, makes uh, very important um, uh, influence on relations between people. Uh, also, it is uh, a question of migration issue uh, because uh, Russia accepts uh, the biggest uh, number of uh, labor migrants uh, from uh, Central Asia first. Uh, also, Russia accepts uh, um, quite a significant number of migrants from Moldova, from Ukraine, uh, despite uh, the conflict from Belarus. Uh, uh, and um, of uh, Caucasian countries as well. And uh, this uh, factor also influences how Russia is per perceived, uh, how it is, how much it is attractive uh, as the source of uh, labor, source of uh, gain money. And uh, also, this is an opportunity to uh, create this area of uh, soft power to. Um, expand uh, culture, some senses, and so on. And also, um, especially recently, during I guess um, six, seven years, uh, and even more, there are some other ideas. Russia tries to create and to develop uh, so called great ideas, geopolitical ideas, uh, which uh, include other regions, other countries uh, to. Uh, participate in those uh, new areas of ideas of international relations. For example, it uh, used to be from Lisbon to Vladivostok. Uh, now it is um, more focused. Uh, more focus is made on uh, such con concepts as Greater Eurasia. Uh, also, there is the concept of Eurasian integration on different levels between countries of the post soviet states. Uh, including other countries, as, as for example, Iran, uh, uh, Asian countries, South Asian countries, ASEAN. And uh, I think that this trend will develop. Uh, now more focus uh, of uh, foreign policy uh, Russia makes is about, I could say, COVID diplomacy, health diplomacy. But I think that soon we will see how we're coming back to those great ideas. Uh, main uh, spheres, um, main directions of this cooperation uh, and um, so far um, influence uh, which Russia um, engaged is uh, first is education. I think maybe it's the strongest uh, tool in the post service space because um, still um, main uh, students which come to Russia are from uh, the post service. Space uh, lead the country which uh, exports their students to Russia is Kazakhstan. Uh, also, there are many students from uh, Central Asia, from some other countries, from Belarus, for example. Still, uh, Russia has students from Ukraine, especially Eastern Ukraine. And uh, it's an important uh, tool for Russian self power and public diplomacy. And um, officially, on the official level, it is also a proclaim that Russia should develop its uh, international dimension of education and uh, to invite more and more students, including uh, via online uh, platforms. Uh, then it's science. Uh, of course, there are some challenges for Russia and Russian scientists. Uh, it's not so. 
actively uh, developing in the um, context of soft power as education, but still it's the facts of uh, attraction of people from prosperous states. Uh, also, it is, of course, sport. Uh, some cultural, uh, cultural uh, could be products uh, as uh, um, we can here mean uh, both uh, classical culture, some like Pushkin, Dostoevsky, and so on, the Russian ballads, and um, and uh, we can here uh, take into account mass uh, cultural products. Uh, they are not so famous uh, in Western world, for example, in Asian world, but those are Russian. Um, speaking uh, products, I mean, for Russian speaking audience, uh, very popular in countries of the post Soviet state, some uh, TV shows, uh, music in Russian, uh, some even uh, uh, TikTok um, bloggers, and uh, it's uh, becoming more and more popular for, uh, among uh, post Soviet uh, states. Uh, but uh, also, this process uh, means that uh, some Post-Soviet stars are also getting popular in Russia. I mean, from Ukraine, from Kazakhstan, from Belarus. So uh, it's not only a one-sided process. Uh, process. Also, uh, this uh, officially public diplomacy. I mean, some um, special uh, uh, programs uh, for young political and not only political leaders when they come to Russia. There's a lot of uh, such festivals, forums. Uh, and uh, as well business dialogue. Uh, well, the main goal of that is uh, not only a building communication, building dialogue, which is of course very important, but also it has a, a goal to get prepared for inevitable change of political elites in the region, because it's uh, the process which is going to happen uh, no matter what. Uh, then also another factor is competition with other actors in the region and uh, also uh, such, uh, let's say, a soft power action or public diplomacy action, they also very often help to um, resolve some political issues uh, via non-official changes. Um, the main uh, uh, challenges and perspectives, I see that I'm short of time, so I will be, uh, I'll try to focus very shortly. One minute, uh, well, last minute, please. Yeah, okay, uh, let it be my conclusion. So the main challenge for Russia is uh, focus more on the past, uh, not on the future, but on the past, so the common heritage, uh, while um, soft power is strongly connected to what perspective a country and state can afford to, to the world, to offer to the world. And um, uh, this, uh, I guess, uh, uh, this is one of the core uh, problems which Russia is trying to uh, revise now and to change it to make uh, soft power more effective and more, um, and really to make it uh, soft and uh, to make, um, uh, to become more, I could say, contemporary in the post Soviet space. Uh, so, um, I think that uh, in very close future, we will see with the change of political elites in Russia, uh, it's getting younger, slowly, but it's getting younger, we will see that approaches to soft power will also change. So, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you, all the speakers. And I, I'm really sorry I had to pressure your, you a little bit, but it's really tremendously difficult to squeeze five speakers in one hour. So if the organizers allow, we have a few questions. I'm not sure if we can uh, ask them. Uh, there is a question to Dr. Leela. Uh, what are the soft power, poten uh, what is the soft power potential of Nepal? How can we use it to fulfill our national interest? Dr. Leela, could you please briefly answer the question? Uh, yes, I have already answered to that question in the chat box. Mm -hmm. so. I so you understand. okay. Uh, so what are the constraints uh, of uh, Russia's soft power strategies? I think this is the question to Ms. Victoria. Uh, yes, and, I and, think... and and again, how do you assess the role of Russia in implementing the soft power policies globally after the outbreak of COVID nineteen? If it's possible to refer to it briefly. 
Okay, very shortly. Um, Although it's a very broad question. Yeah, uh, very broad questions. But I think that main constraint is that uh, not only resources, of course, it's also constrained because uh, Russia lacks some, uh, I could say, strategic thinking uh, about uh, how to use those instruments of soft power. We have a very uh, good uh, tradition of how to conduct diplomacy, how to uh, um, develop military uh, power and so on, but soft power is something new for Russian foreign policy. Also, of course, it's used, but it's not so traditional as some other uh, things. And of course, uh, some sources, even financial, um, for even for NGOs, it's not so easy uh, to find uh, sources. And um, I think it's also heritage from the 90s, which deal with uh, Russia on the different levels, so the level of government, the level of NGOs trying to uh, deal with. And about COVID-19, uh, well, uh, first, I think that uh, this uh, attempt uh, of Russia to help to the neighborhood with the test systems, with the uh, uh, medicine, uh, some equipment, and also help with the vaccine is maybe one of the main steps uh, of uh, this uh, uh, maybe the new approach of soft power and trying to use this not very positive situation in the world to make something positive uh, is uh, uh, this try this attempt to use those uh, soft power instruments. Thank you very much. Thank you. I I'm not sure if we could ask any more questions because it's already after half past four and the next session should begin. So uh, therefore, uh, I would like to say thank you to all our five distinguished speakers and for, for your very informative presentations. And we covered various issues within this panel on soft power from ASEAN policy, from India's soft power strategies to India-China to uh, Russian soft power and, and Chinese soft power through academia and through film India US. So there are so many various topics to be covered, which just speaks volumes of, of, of that th this topic is really uh, deserves attention, the soft power policies um, or um, soft influence uh, policies. Thank you very much. And I would like to hand over to the organizers. Please take it forward. Uh, yeah, so at the end, uh, I'd like to showcase the vote of thanks video so that to express our gratitude to all those who pre are presented. Distinguished chair, speakers, ladies and gentlemen, as we have come to the end of this session, we would like to express a sincere gratitude and thanks to the chair for agreeing to chair and moderate the session today. A sincere thanks also goes to all the speakers for being a part of the event and delivering such comprehensive and convincing presentations. We would like to acknowledge our gratitude to our friends from the diplomatic community, experts, academia, media and different organizations. Finally, we must also mention our deep sense of appreciation for the audience who participated in the webinar and those who are watching us live. Thank you for your valuable time and attention and for making this session productive with your questions. Once again, we are truly honored to have you all with us today. Please do join us in the next session. Thank you so much.